Welcome back, students, to this lecture with me, your host and professor, Earl Care Brown. Let's take a look at some text-to-speech stuff. We're going to talk about concepts with some demos, actually. Okay, let's go. So speech synthesis, also called text-to-speech, or TTS for short, or even speech generation, is the idea of going from text or orthography right out to a sound file. And the task is to generate spoken speech um, right from text. And um, what issues are there? Well, anyone in particular, should we try and clone someone's voice or just have a synthesized voice? Uh, what is the training data that we train a model on? What approach? Are there ethical considerations, especially with voice cloning? Yeah, there are some serious ethical challenges or considerations when you clone someone's voice. There's a challenge here is that humans are good at identifying non-human speech. And there's this uncanny valley that um, is when people feel a sense of unease or even revulsion or rejection in response to humanoid robots that are too highly realistic. And people are more prone to criticize advanced technologies that are more human-like. So that's the, uh, this idea of an uncanny valley. Let me zoom in here. The uncanny valley effect is a hypothesized psychological and aesthetic relation between an object's degree of resemblance to a human being and the emotional response to the object. Examples of the phenomenon exist among robotics, 3D computer animations, and lifelike dolls. Okay, so here on the right-hand side, let me remove myself. On the right-hand side, we have this plot here. We have affinity on the y-axis, right? And the more human-like on the x-axis. So as something becomes more and more human, there's like this affinity to it. But once it gets too close to a human being, there's this huge drop off. And um, people do not like to think things that are too human like. That's the idea there. So let's go back to this view. Um, state of the art. Well, there's quite a few commercially available systems out there um, with APIs, that is application program interfaces or with subscription services. And they, there's a big range, right? And at the time of recording, I'm gonna put 11 labs at the top or near the top. They have a really good system. 11 labs is a company here and they have this, they sell their, their product, right? But they have a little demo here. Let's look at their text-to-speech demo. Um, let me just change this to, let me just change this to something like, how does this thing work? I wonder if it works well. Let me zoom in a bit on that. How does this thing work? I wonder if it works well. Let's have Rachel, an American influencer, say that. Okay, let's see if she can say it. How does this thing work? I wonder if it works well. It sounds really good. I don't know if you, it sounds really good. This is state of the art. This is, um, I feel like they've done a really good job. There are many open source or research systems available. For example, on Hugging Face, there's thousands available here. Um, let me see if I can do a quick demo on one of these. Uh, let's just try this one right here. This is from Facebook, their massively multilingual speech, English uh, text-to-speech system. Let me just write that same thing. In fact, I can just copy and paste if I want, right? Copy, paste here, compute. Let's see if we can do this quickly. Here we go, let's listen to this one. How does this thing work? I wonder if it works well. Okay, so yeah, more computer-like. Um, there are quite a few other models there. I, let me just jump back to Hugging Face. Uh, quite a few other models here, and I'll demo um, Koki when I talk about voice cloning. Okay, um, so those can be stand standalone, or they can be in a pipeline, for example, like doing speech-to-speech -speech translation, right, on your phone if you're talking to your phone in English and have it translate and then interpret, well, I'll use the word interpret here, right? In another language, it um, needs to do some TTS or text-to-speech in the other language. Here's a Wikipedia article, comparison of speech synthesizers. Um, quite a few out there, some you know are oldies but goodies. And um, Nuance has a good one as well. Anyway, I'll let you look at that. Speech production, conceptualization. Well, let's talk about how humans generate speech. First, you have an idea or some type of message in your mind that you want to write, formulate, you need to formulate, and then you put it into language, whatever language code, English or Spanish or whatever, 
And then you have to control your your muscles. There's this neuromuscular action to control your tongue and your jaw and your velum in your mouth if you have a nasal, right? Um, and that creates sound and there's resonances, right? If you're producing vowels, you have formants, right? And you end up with a sound wave that travels through the air par uh, particles, the air molecules over to someone's else, someone else's ear or the diaphragm of a microphone and is received, right? That's how it works. Well, text-to-speech is somewhat similar. I mean, the, the end goal is, right? First, you take some input text in the form of sentences or paragraphs or even just words. And if they are more, if it's more than one word, then you tokenize it, normalize it, normalize like make sure it's all the same function, um, same capitalization. And you do some syntactic parsing. You go to into pronunciation dictionary that takes the the orthographic form and puts it into some phonemic or phonetic form, right? Um, like we've seen with the ASR system going the other way, the automated speech recognition software going the other way, right? Um, and then you have some prosody rules, right? Prosody is an important part of speech to make a, a speech system, a TTS system sound good. There's got, got to be some prosody going on there. Articulation motion, waveform generator, and then the actual sound wave that is produced either as a file or just um, play it on speakers. Okay. Good. Here's various diagrams um, from the internet um, or different sources about the components of a TTS system. And um, let's take a look at the top left here. You have input sentence that gets processed, has some type of text processing that happens, and it gets turned into a phonemic sequence, right, with the um, grapheme to phoneme conversion going from orthography to a, ph a phonemic representation. And you have acoustic synthesis, and you have prosodic control there as well. And it, it deals with du duration rules and the pauses. Um, here's some other ones I grabbed off the internet as well. This bottom left one here deals with um, machine learning, a neural network machine learning with an encoder decoder architecture and a vocoder there. So why do we have to do text, text processing? Well, homographs are rampant in English and other languages as well, right? So for example, this first sentence, my cat who lives dangerously had nine lives. Those are homographs. Lives, lives. Uh, what about abbreviations like these, these letters? Henry V. Well, it's Henry V is what people say, right? Henry V. But we got a V there. Um, not Charles I. I believe. Anyway, you get the idea that being able to parse that out correctly and put it into the correct form um, is important to create human-like speech. If, I were to, if the TTS system were to say Henry V., part I, act I, I, you know, it would not, it would throw the human off. Like, what do you say? Oh, Henry V, part one, act two. Okay, I see what you're saying. Anyway, so that's important to, to take that into account when you're doing uh, text-to-speech processing. And punctuation conveys more meaning than we usually imagine in speech. And um, so punctuation is important and how the TTS system deals with punctuation in the orthography that it receives in, into the system. And then constituent boundaries also interact with prosody. For example, this first sentence right here. He wanted to opt in for, or excuse me, he wanted to opt for a drive-in. Drive-in is one kind of constituent or one lexical unit, right? It's a type of movie from the past, um, right? And drive-in has this kind of falling pros uh, pros uh, prosodic contour, right? The next one, he wanted to opt for a drive in the country. Drive-in there. In the country is this prepositional phrase that modifies where the drive would happen, right? And so that boundary between drive and in there affects the prosody. Um, okay. Also, there's domain specific prosody like zip codes and phone numbers and street addresses, right? Um, there's a funny Everyone Loves Raymond episode where his dad doesn't say the, the phone number the way he's is expected to say like the way that most people say it and so uh, Raymond has to like like wait dad you said 16 I can't get a, a one in there now <laughs> anyway so yeah there's, there's prosody around um, numbers and addresses as well and then there's intonational focus for example it will be rainy today in Boston if I were to stress rainy right it would have more um, it would be longer in duration and have a higher um, intensity or volume right it will be raining today in Boston versus it will be raining today in Boston, like con contrasting from yesterday. 
uh, it will be raining Boston. It will be raining today in Boston rather than Vermont or something, right? So you get the idea that intonation has an, an effect on um, how we communicate ideas. Oops. Here's a website with some older TTS examples. Um, let me just play a, a one or two here. This is kind of an old system. This is a short introduction to the Festival Speech Synthesis System. Festival was developed by Alan Black. And okay, so you hear those, there's pauses in there. Let me go back. There are pauses in there. Um, and we'll see in a couple slides that you can actually put in. You can say, emphasize this word. And in fact, we'll just do it right here. Here it is. It will be rainy today in Boston. Let's look at that example. It will be rainy today in Boston. Right, and so the rainy, and this is obviously a very um, old system, very computer-like, but the idea I'm trying to get across is that, that some systems you can say, emphasize this word with a little HTML, excuse me, uh, XML tag. These are XML tags right here. They're emphasizing that word rather than this word or Boston. Okay. Good. Basic approaches. Well, there's kind of three main um, approaches, um, among others now these days. There's an articulatory synthesizer that um, models or simulates all pertinent aspects of the vocal apparatus, the human vocal apparatus. And there's physiology and acoustics and neuromotor physics going on there. There's a concatenative, concatenative synthesizer, which uh, computes linguistic units and selects corresponding speech sound recordings and then smooth the transitions. It kind of just splices things together into this um, sequence, trying to smooth out the transitions between the, the concatenated segments. A formant synthesizer um, has audio, is an audio acoustic, and it, the models the main features, um, not of the, ap the articulatory apparatus, but rather of the properties of the sound signal. And so you have the source, which is phonation, plus some filters or formants to give um, resonance. And Pratt has all three of those um, synthesizers. <clears throat> Units of speech analysis. Well, it's relevant for text-to-speech as well as for ASR, automated speech recognition. I mean, it, the idea is how, how should we slice up the sounds that we're hearing or we're trying to produce, right? Concatenation is the most common technique. You store audio recordings of um, pieces of speech and you splice them together. So what do you concatenate? Well, a word level will be too big. A phoneme level is too small. And so a good um, kind of balance is uh, a diphone that is two phones together. They're about a thousand for English or demi syllables, which are like half syllables, um, perhaps about a thousand for English as well. Those turn out to be better than doing simple um, phonemes, one phoneme after another, because there's so much articulatory co-articulation co with flanking sounds that, um, only going all the way down to the phoneme level is not a good approach. How do we model speech and articulation? Well, like I said, prosody is important there um, with rhythm and tempo and accent, intonation, stress, phrasing, right? Um, the syllable, the segment, the syllable uh, is important with creating human-like TTS systems. Speech rate, right, should vary. Humans vary their speech rate, so trying to get a system to vary their speech rate is important. Like the ones I just played that were kind of old old synthesizers, the speech rate was very kind of monotone. But the newer one from Eleven Labs that I played at the beginning of the, the lecture here, yeah, I don't know if you noticed, you probably didn't notice, but it had kind of different um, speech rates throughout the, the segment. Dialect, emotions, and gender, right, has an important part um, on modeling speech as well as phonological processes and clitization, clitics, like words that get stuck onto other words that are not stressed, basically pronounced as if they were part of the same word. Um, and having a lexicon there. Oops, keep touching my mouse, I don't mean to. Okay, um, yeah, so there's diff quite a few different things here, trying to um, model the vocal fo folds and respiration, all sorts of stuff that goes into TTS systems. Um, also vocal characteristics, right? Um, different ranges, different fundamental frequencies, uh, creakiness and vibrato, uh, breathiness. And uh, there are other factors that, that go into how a voice sounds, a human voice sounds, right? Genetics and aging, right? The voice changes with age, language and culture, emotion, um, diseases. All sorts of things can go into 
trying to create a computer system that sounds like a human. So like I mentioned to you, there are examples, and I just showed you a couple examples, um, where you can tell a TTS system to emphasize this word. So on the top right of my screen, it's kind of hard to see. Let me make this bigger on the fly. Make this much bigger for the moment on the fly. Um, you can see here that we have the uh, HTML tag around big. This is a big car. We have emphasis there. This is, a, um, I said X HTML, it's actually XML. XML tag here right before big and the closing XML tag right after big. Here's another one. This is a huge car. So it has emphasis, but it has the attribute of strong right here, level equals strong. And so some systems can take in uh, XML annotation to to affect the, the way things are said. Certain words are said in, in there. Um, yeah, so the Sable XML, the Sable um, system here, I, I just showed you that. So I saw a, a girl in the park break. Let's break right there with a the telescope. I saw the girl break in the park. So here's an example. This is, again, kind of an older example, but you get the idea that you can have a TTS system emphasize or cause or take breaks. Listen. The boy saw the girl in the park with a telescope. The boy saw the girl in the park. So you can hear that there at the first, uh, first time it, there was a break after park, but then the second time there was a break after girl. And you can do other, other languages where, as well. Okay, good. Um, emotion, good. Trying to uh, model emotion is important as well. Uh, synthesizing more than speech, the more information, the better. Went up to a limit, right? Animated human uh, talking heads, like virtual humanoid, um, can, again, like I mentioned before, the Uncanny Valley thing. Here's an example of, this is an example of a PhD position at a university in Sweden that they're advertising through this talking head thing. Listen to this. We have a PhD position in conversational speech synthesis for like collaborative robots. We will develop robots that can help humans in domestic settings by performing simple physical tasks. The overall goal is to design robot behaviors. That are I didn't even get the idea that um, they they're more than just the voice. They're having to synthesize the the eye movements, the mouth movements, the head kind of tilting, and, and the pauses. Like all sorts of things go into to actual speech rather than just the sounds. Um, so yeah, gestures and eyebrows and, and mouth and jaw. Uh, movement, emotion, uh, blinking. Also, if, if a humanoid thing doesn't blink, it is disconcerting to a, a real human to say, why aren't you blinking? We, we humans blink and you're not. Seemed safe and uh, more important. There's a blink right there. Anyway, you get the idea. There's a lot that goes into um, a humanoid robot synthesizing speech. It's not just the speech itself. Um, so yeah, morphing between uh, visual configurations. These seams are um, the units of correlation of, for mouth and speech, right? Here's a real cartoonishy example, just really basic. It was like closed, open, and rounded. Take a look at this little cartoon. Everybody wants to come in on top. Okay, you got it. So let me just back up frame by frame. His mouth is somewhat open. Now it's mostly closed, teeth showing, open mouth. Uh, more closed, but still open, closed mouth. You get the idea there's very few actual different um, shapes of the mouth in this cartoon um, version. If you get more and more you know, variation like we saw with that advertisement for that PhD program, it, it looks more human-like. Um, so trying to get more positions of the mouth, the eyelids, the, the eyes themselves, and also trying to get transitions between those. In that cartoon, there was no transition. It was just the next one. You know, There's no transition at all in that cartoon when we just saw Voice conversion, this is modifying one person's speech um, so that's recognizable as another's. <clears throat> and we can use the same model. So we kind of escape this constraint of having a person-specific training database or databases. And that we can use a system, but then just um, clone or convert um, someone else's voice. <clears throat> and um, we map between a source and target speaker data and their physiological vocal track modeling techniques. And this is useful for dubbing, for morpheme, um, right, in movies. So let's take a look at this graphic from Eleven Labs and how does voice cloning work. Uh, number one, you record a subject's voice, and then you analyze it, the AI, 
identifies unique vocal characteristics like pitch, tone, intonation, and accent. And then feature extraction, it breaks the voice into its smaller components to grasp finer elements of speech patterns, right? getting down to like the millisecond level. And then number four goes into a machine learning network, um, training network, uh, a neural network uh, architecture, and um, is trained using a uh, machine learning current, you know, the current models are neural network based, which is based on how the brain works. That's the idea behind a neural network is, is there's math that tries to simulate what happens in the human brain. Number five is synthesis. Now it can generate this, the synthesized speech and then refine it. Finally, the, you refine the output to enhance its naturalness and, and accuracy. So let's try this. Here um, are a couple examples. Here's a news article. Uh, about Joe Biden's voice being cloned and about AI in general from National Public Radio. Let me just play a little bit here. Uh, if I go to, let's just listen here and go. Live from in. Book to Stephen Boyce. He's uh, when he talks to campaigns where generative AI is so convenient. Local lawmaker in Michigan, uh, Rep. Penelope Cernoglu, she played an AI generated version of President Biden, congratulating her on a new bill to combat AI generated disinformation. Take a listen. Hi, Representative Cernoglu. Uh, it's your buddy, Joe. I really liked your bill that requires disclaimers on political ads that use artificial intelligence. No more malarkey. Uh, as my dad used to say, Joey, you can't believe everything you hear. Not a joke. By the way, this statement was created using artificial intelligence. So again, not... So, yeah, it's pretty darn good. It's pretty darn... Um faithful to the way Joe Biden uh, speaks. And I um, I uh, messed around with the Koki AI's uh, TTS system where you can clone voices and created a little video here. Well, let me, let me get back to that right here. Um, let me just show you. So I, I, I gave it about eight seconds or so of my speech and then I had it um, speak English, but I also had to speak Russian. You can have it speak Russian or other languages. I think it, um, Koki has 17 languages right now. Let me show you a bit about that. Let me show you the example that I had it um, use my voice to speak Russian. Let me get down here. Ready, set, listen. Here is my voice speaking Russian. My name is Errol Brown. I study linguistics at the University of Brigham Young. I live in the Spanish Fork, state Utah. Со своей женой и тремя из пяти моих детей. У нас нет собаки. So yeah, um, it's not hard to clone someone's voice these days, and there are some serious um, ethical considerations there, right? Um, unfortunately, people don't care about that and use it to do bad things. But yeah, it's it's pretty easy to clone someone's voice, your own voice, for example, um, these days. Also, you can use machine learning, like I mentioned, to refine the output, um, categorize basic text-based issues, also dealing with prosody, um, high and low intonation contours, right? Uh, often using the TOBI, the TOBI um, annotation system. TOBI stands for tones and break indices. It's, it's a common transcribing and annotation system for prosody and speech. And... Um, you know, you, maybe you've seen this uh, in some of the courses, linguistic courses, right? An H asterisk is a pitch accent, uh, high and low, respectively, right? H dash is a phrase accent, and boundary tones have um, percent signs there. So you may have seen this type of in this uh, type of notation in the past, but <clears throat> the bottom right, you can see that those are kind of indicated in a Pratt text grid. And so you can use those to have a machine learning model learn intonations, uh, intonation contours based on um, training data. That's annotated like that in the bottom right of the screen right now. Okay. Uh, more examples. So there's an excellent historical record of short examples in this uh, CLACT record. So let's just play a little bit here. So here is a voco voter from 1939. Listen to this. I gotta pull it down to my hard drive. Let me just um, do that real quick if I can get this up. Um, let's see here, play this. One, the voter of Homer Dudley, 
1939. Will you please make the voters say for our Eastern listeners, good evening, radio audience. Good evening, radio audience. And now for our Western listeners, say, good afternoon, radio audience. Yeah, you get the idea that, um, I mean, that was in 1939. <laughs> so there, it was super, you know, computerized and barely intelligible. But um, if you want, you can look through these, um, look through these examples of a historical record of the progress of, of uh, speech synthesizers from the past. <clears throat> Here's an excellent one. Um, Google's Tacotron has some good examples here. Listen to these examples. Let's go down to um, audio examples here. Let's listen to this one. Vainly, he cast about once more for the ashtray that wasn't there. And then, in a moment of utter unthinking, he flipped the butt into the sodden air. Okay. Good. Vainly, he cast about... Anyway, what they have here is um, examples of um, their TTS system. It's pretty darn good as well. Tacotron. You can take a look there with... Um, Vainly, he cast about... They have different parameters and different settings here to show the, the effect. Anyway, so that's um, a state of the art. Play, you know, a couple dozen just to get a good feel. And here is another um, system. This is a, a company, Nuance, which creates, um, which is in the speech processing space, ASR as well as TTS. And uh, if we do an example here, let me just have it play its preloaded example. Hi, how can I help you? Great, no problem. Your transaction is complete. Have a great day. Anyway, so yeah, they're getting real good um, with modern systems. Come a long way since 1939, right? Here's some other examples. Um, I have quite a few listed here, but again, it's hard to keep up. The space is moving so quickly that um, here's some other examples. Festival, this is a pretty old one, um, but you can take a look here, look at their online demo uh, from the University of Edinburgh, the Center for Speech Technology Research there. Uh, Open Mary is another system. I gotta update that link. Uh, eSpeak is an early system as well. And then there's some more modern ones down here. Google's um, has this, there's this Python package that allows you to use Google's synthesizer through an API call. That is, you're actually sending your text, your orthography, your, your written text, right, transcript to Google, and they synthesize and send you back the, the file is what happens there with that. Um, so anyway, there are quite a few systems here, as well as that are not listed here. Um, Festival allows um, XML markup is supported like I showed before you know having emphasis or breaks other things that happen in speech you can explicitly mark those if you like um, these days you can use a machine learning model to try and learn where should a break be taken also based on punctuation that um, the punctuation can tell the TTS system where to take a break or where to emphasize things FESFOX has some different resources here. You can take a look at these. Um, this is from Carnegie Mellon University, which um, has one of the best computational linguistic programs. Um, so they have some examples here of this FESFOX system. You can take a look there. And there's some more resources here that you can search. Hugging Face has a nice page, somewhat short about text-to-speech. You can take a look at this. There's a short video there. and um, what I want to point out is they, they point to many TTS models that are open source right here on their, on Hugging Face. Uh, here's Facebook's. Koki is the one I use to clone my voice. Microsoft has one here. Um, a lot of people will, will like fine tune or modify somehow these other models coming from companies and to do some specific task. For example, I had a student um, in this class in the past who took the Whisper ASR system and fine-tuned it to um, recognize lyrics and speech of the LDS Church, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, that were made for youth, the youth songs. So anyway, there's a lot of models in here. Um, ESPNet has a good model as well. Take a look at that one. Anyway, there's all sorts of, of TTS models. 
It is a fast-moving space. Like I mentioned here, um, the University of Edinburgh has the Center for Speech Technology Research, and they have um, some publications and downloads that you can look at here and um, get systems going. This is the, um, the Institute for Research and Coordination in Acoustics and Music in France. There's some resources here you could look at, look at their page. There are other usual places to go for speech-related research. I have some links here to various, various sites. Um, this one is the International Speech Com Communication Association, ISCA, right, and others there. And um, there's, I have some more links there you can look at these. So the next lab is to look at two different TTS systems and get them working as best you can. If you have more time, you can uh, do more. If uh, you find yourself struggling to even get one working, then don't worry about getting a second one working. Also, the final class project is coming up. You need to think about that. Just start thinking through what is the problem or the task you like, like to do with speech processing. Why is it interesting? Who cares? Why, why do you care? Number one, and who else might care? And what's been done, like what prior literature has been, been uh, published, what prior projects um, or relevant approaches might be useful to you. And what is your solution or your approach to asking or answering the question you have or solving the problem? Which tools might you use? Which programming languages? Uh, what corpora if you need uh, corpora? And then how to evaluate your project. All right. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.